Everybody, thanks for watching. This next video is going to blow your mind. I think I have evidence that connects Brian Koberger to the two Oregon murders, and I may have uncovered a third murder in another state that he's connected to. I'll tell you what state that is later in the video, but first I have to cover some details on these three cases so I can lay the groundwork on how I arrived at that conclusion. Please be sure to subscribe if you like the video. So looking at our victims here, Sandra Ladd on the left would have been our first victim. She was attacked on June 13th, 2020. Her date of death is noted as June 14th of 2020, but we don't know if she was attacked late on the 13th or in the early morning hours of the 14th. Travis and Jamie Lynn were attacked on August 13th of 2021, and the Idaho students were attacked on November 13th of 2022. So we're looking at about 14 months in between each of these crimes. So looking at the location of these crimes, we can see here at marker A is where Brian lived in Pullman, Washington. The white dot here is Moscow, Idaho. Near Portland at marker B would be where Sandra lived. And then down here at marker C near Salem is where Travis and Jamie Lynn lived. So I think the key thing here is the fact that these crimes occurred outside of the state that Brian lived in. Um, I don't think there's really a significance in the fact that Portland is, is six hours away from where Brian lives. I don't think he was trying to create distance between himself and the crime. Um, he was comfortable with committing this crime right in his backyard. The key here is it was across the state line. This one was across the state line. And Brian, being a criminology student, is very aware that when you commit crimes across state lines, it makes it much harder to figure out who committed them and if they're connected. So here's a close-up view of where Sandra lived up on the top right in Camas, just outside of Portland. And then down here is where Travis and Jamie Lynn lived in Silverton. We're looking at about an hour and 15 minute drive between these two locations. So one could realistically get from Portland to Salem, I believe in roughly an hour going down the highway. So this isn't necessarily a great distance to travel. So just keep that in mind later on when I talk about some of the reasons why I believe Brian is connected to this. So I want to lay down some groundwork from the Idaho case that we know about. Um, there's some key details here that are uh, critical for connecting these together that I want to share. Um, so let me just um, take a look at the uh, victims first. So we have um, Maddie, Kaylee, and Zanna, the three girls, and then Ethan, the one male that was attacked. Um, I want to point out here that Ethan is not a small guy. He's a, he's a pretty good-sized person. He's pretty athletic. I've seen videos of him wakeboarding. I don't know if he played any sports in college, but um, if Ethan were in a hallway with somebody and he were fighting for his life, I do think Ethan would be a somewhat formidable person to deal with. Now, I do believe that Kaylee was the main target of the attack. Um, I'm going to explain why in just a second. Um, let's look at how these crimes occurred. So the person snuck into the home between 3 and 4 in the morning while the students were asleep. They ambushed the students in their beds. Um, two other young women who were at the bottom level of the home were unharmed and were not aware of the crime. So if we look at the house here, um, I do believe that Brian was comfortable committing the crime in this location because of the privacy that it provided. Um, when I was looking at the other cases, that is one of the connections that I made. All of the um, locations that these crimes occurred were in secluded private places to some extent, at least enough to where somebody couldn't just easily see um, Brian lurking nearby or even um, entering the home or committing the crimes. Now, I do believe Brian was watching the home when the students came in. I think he waited and, um, until he was comfortable that everybody had gone to sleep. I do think he entered into the back door here and went upstairs uh, where the girls were. Um, it's my belief that he attacked Maddie first, and I think that she was dispatched of very quickly. And I think in that process, Kaylee would have been stirred and potentially woken up. Now, this is where I think I'm going to share some information that has not been released yet. Um, so just hang in there with me. So Kaylee's dad had made a statement early on in the news that the attack on these girls was, he used the words, a brutal attack. And he also mentioned that the girls had different injuries. And a lot of us thought at the time before we knew who Brian was, that maybe it was a different weapon or it was more than one attacker. Now what I believe Kaylee's dad was telling us 
is, in my opinion, I think after Maddie was dealt with, I believe that Brian beat Kaylee. I don't think that he just stabbed her. Now, if we look at Brian's profile, we know that when he was in high school, based off of people that knew him, he was always trying to fight people. He was into boxing. He was into kickboxing. Brian was a person who was holding inside a lot of rage and anger towards specific types of people. So when Kaylee's dad made that statement that this was a brutal attack on these girls and that these injuries were so horrible and that they were attacked, or I'm sorry, that they had different injuries, that really stuck with me. And I really do believe that Kaylee was also beaten in addition to being stabbed. Now, I think from here, Brian intended to exit the home and come down to the second floor and attack Xana. Now, Ethan being in the home, um, I do think that Brian was aware Ethan was in the home, but he still went through with his plan. Now, I think as he was coming down the stairs, Ethan may have even been coming out to kind of investigate. And I believe that um, there was a confrontation that happened in the hallway there. Now, keep in mind, I did mention that Ethan is a bigger person. He is somewhat athletic. He would be a formidable, per formidable person to just dispatch the way he was. Now, I do think there was a struggle and um, I do think that that struggle did not last long at all. I think this was a very quick struggle. And I think Xana was awake and heard the, the struggle happening. I think she was petrified with fear. She may not have had her phone nearby. And I think she may have tried to hide during the struggle, just kind of as her um, reaction to what was happening, possibly between the bed and the wall. And I think that after the um, fight with Ethan, Brian entered her room and attacked her. Now, the fact that that fight with Ethan was so quick and quiet enough to where it didn't wake the other girls really stood out to me. Um, when I kind of played this crime through in my head, you know, initially I kind of thought of, you know, maybe the, the um, killer attacked him from behind or, or something like that. But um, I'm going to show you something that I uncovered that's a really interesting clue here that I think supports my theory. And I think this helps develop a little more of a picture of Brian and what his MO is. And again, this is really key with connecting these other crimes. We have to understand what Brian's method of operation is so that we can see if there is a connection between what's happening. So I do think Brian was spooked after the crimes and he escaped as quickly as he could. And I do think that that video footage is him fleeing the scene. Okay, everybody, so here's where this gets really interesting. So you may recall in my past videos, I did some deep dives on Brian's Instagram account and some of the accounts that he was following. So I circled back and I just did a little more research. And the reason I did that is because every single account that I've looked into that Brian was following through that Instagram had some sort of logical connection to Brian. You'll recall in that first video I released where uh, we followed one of those accounts and it led us to this playlist that said beats that you plan your crimes to so that lined up perfectly with who brian would be it then took us further in and we found something called goon tape well that goon tape was connected to another video that brian had posted way back in october so to me that was a valid video that was uncovered that he posted in october and then here we find one of these accounts leading us right to that exact promo video and that exact product I don't think that's a coincidence. I do believe that some of these accounts are connected to Brian in one way or another, and I'm going to reveal later on what that connection is. So I looked into this account here, um, and this is really what um, kind of made everything click for me. I'm going to show you what happened. Now, I hope everybody can see my screen okay. I think the best way to do this is just to share my screen and let you kind of follow along with the um investigating that I was doing. So again, this account is an account that Brian Koberger's account was following. So my curiosity here is, you know, what is Brian interested in? Why would he be following this account? You know, where is this going to lead us? Um, and then looking at the other accounts, um, I was starting to kind of see a pattern of things. And so, you know, looking at each, each one as I went through, they just continued to be connected. So we just talked a little bit about 
Brian and his fighting ability, right? His interest in boxing, his interest in kickboxing when he was in high school. So sure enough, we come to this account and what I'm doing here, I'm looking for a connection to Brian. What, what could connect this account to Brian? So I clicked on this first little post and uh, listened to this video and let me know what you think. And while you listen to this video, I want you to um, think of that encounter with Ethan at the same time. You have to see training for what it is. Training is about skill development, not about winning or losing. You've got to you've got to understand that you don't need to win every battle. You only need to win the battles that count. So what do you all think? That statement, you don't have to win every battle. You only have to win the battles that count. Do you think that that could be something that Brian might like or you know follow or, or watch that video for some reason so i'm sure you know a lot of people still don't believe me so let's just let's look a little bit further into this so there is one post so in my opinion this account is um somewhat of a burner account i think that it's very easy to create accounts if you were maybe wanting to follow something or somebody or maybe just look into a product or something that you're interested in and maybe you created an account so that you could have more access into looking into something. So, you know, this account was created and there's there's really just one post here, you know, so I was kind of curious. I'm like, okay, what, what's the post? And you can see here, this post was November 11th, 2022, two days before the Idaho murders. And it says, and so it begins. Now, again, I'm not saying any of these accounts are Brian's, are, are you know, involved in the crime or are responsible for the crime. This is just what I found when I followed the account that Brian's account was following. And what I'm looking for here, again, are connections to Brian to validate this stuff and validate what his interests are. So not a big deal, right? Just one post. But, you know, I did find that date a little bit curious along with that statement. Again, not saying that's Brian writing that. I'm just saying just just odd. Now you tie that with the fighting video. Now I think that that fighting video really lines up with what I've been learning about Brian and his interests. So I'm sure, you know, this isn't enough evidence yet for you. So I'm going to show you more evidence here. So the followers here um, are just kind of spam followers. There wasn't any, there aren't any real people here um, for the followers of this account. These are all just kind of a spam. So that just kind of supports the idea that this is some sort of just kind of extra account or side account that somebody may have created. Who created it? Who knows? I've reached out to this person. They did not respond. So I'll let you know if they do. Now let's look at who this account's following. So again, Brian's following this account. Why? We don't know, but let's see who this account's following. So we go here and right away, once again, we have a direct connection to Brian's personality, to Brian's interests. So once again, in my opinion, that supports the validity of some of these things that we're uncovering that Brian would be interested in. And that's all I'm saying about these accounts. All these accounts are things that Brian was interested in. Brian was following them in one way or another for one reason or another. And I believe he had multiple accounts that he would kind of create when he wanted to remain anonymous in things that he was looking at online. And I think all of those anonymous type of accounts have kind of come together and, and that's why we're seeing all these little pieces of what his interests were that connect to his actual account. You know how algorithms work, right? Now, I'm also not saying that Brian likes fighting because he's following these accounts. I think Brian likes fighting and that's why he's following these accounts. So once again, just looking for connections to Brian, I'm kind of scrolling through these names and seeing what you know, what these accounts are. And you'll notice that theme once again. A lot of these are um, combat uh, accounts. We have Libre Fighting. We have My White Belt. Um, we see some of these other accounts that we connected in my other videos also connected to this account. So once again, I mentioned the algorithm and the fact that Brian could have had multiple accounts that he was using. But we do continue to see kind of some themes between them. Um, we see down here Jiu-Jitsu accounts. Um, and then at the top, you know, we have this knife account here, Kramer Custom Knives. So all of these things are once again, just kind of lining up with Brian's personality, right? 
So um, if we scroll down a little further, I want to show you one in particular that really supports my theory um, that one, Brian would be looking at this and two, um, my theory about what happened with Ethan. Okay, so here it is, this one, um, Blade Craft Method. Okay. So here we have a um, an Instagram page, and this person here is a martial artist, and he trains other people on fighting concepts, specifically on fighting concepts using knives and other weapons. For the skeptics out there who are saying, oh, this is still nothing, I just have to ask. This is just one other thing that ties directly in with Brian's personality. Now, I want to show you um, what I believe Brian was following this account for. Um, so there's a specific video here that I want to share. And while I share this video, um, I want everybody to kind of just keep that encounter that I mentioned that um, with Ethan. And um, when you watch this video, um, just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, everybody, so I wanted to share that because I believe that that does support my theory of Brian's MO and Brian's ability to dispatch a person very quickly and very effectively using a knife. I think that Ethan didn't see the attack coming. He probably wasn't even aware that he was about to be attacked. Um, I think Ethan was probably just curious about maybe what he heard and Brian just unleashed this flurry on him and Brian knew exactly where to target to end the fight very quickly. You know, that also ties into Brian's MO of ambushing his targets and something that I also just thought was interesting that in my opinion ties into the coward that Brian really is, is this statement here. Let me know what you all think about that. And finally, just to clarify, I'm not, um, this, this Instagram stuff is not a critical piece of my theory. This is just something that supports um, what we know about Brian, what his personality is. So I'm sharing this because um, all of these things tie together. Um, you know, we have this theme of Brian who has this interest in tactical gear. He's, he's worked as a security guard. He's interested in law enforcement. It would make sense that he has an interest in tactical gear, which we saw a lot of those accounts were related to, okay? He likes knives. We see a lot of knife-related accounts. He used a knife in the murder, so we know that's a fact. So he's following all these accounts that are related to knives. He's following these, these accounts that are related to fighting and weapons. And just in general, he's following accounts that kind of center around crime and violence. Now I'm going to tell you, we haven't even gotten in to this evidence that I've uncovered. This is just a piece of it. There's a lot more to come. Stick with me. This is where it gets really, really good. Okay, so what do we know about Brian? Well, Brian has an interest in tactical gear, weapons. He wants to be a law enforcement officer. He's not afraid of confrontation. He likes fighting. He wants to fight. He follows a lot of fighting online, fighting tactics, looks for tips and videos. In my opinion, Brian trains for his crimes. Brian looks at his crimes and he's, he's getting ready and I think he conditions himself and he, um, you know, that's why he has this, this obsession with these videos and looking for the fighting tips and things like that. You know, and there was something really interesting a neighbor mentioned who lived next door to him in Pullman that she would often hear loud noises coming from his apartment like, somebody working on something or, you know, really loud bangs and things like that. I believe it was Brian training. I think Brian was watching these videos, picking up tips and trying to become this efficient killer. And he was obsessed with winning fights. He wanted to fight people. A lot of anger in Brian. And now look at that picture. Brian's a big guy. He's not a small person. These are law enforcement officers standing next to him. So again, that attack on Ethan in the hallway I believe ended very quickly. I think in general, his attacks were extremely violent, 
extremely rage-filled attacks. But one of these key pieces um, or these key clues that I think ties these crimes together is I really believe that um, he beat his victims in addition to the stabbings. So let's talk about Sandra Ladd. So Sandra was 71 years old. Um, she lived in Portland and she was murdered in the middle of the night while she slept in her bed. We don't know what time for sure. I'm going to say roughly 1 a.m. So looking at the details here, um, she was found deceased in her home with stab wounds to her torso. Um, she was presumably sleeping in the late hours of the 13th when somebody snuck into her home and stabbed her to death. Her crime is still unsolved. So again, she would have lived right here just outside of Portland. Now, I mentioned earlier, you know, what was the connection between Brian and Portland? Well, what do we know about Brian again? Well, Brian is a vegan, right? And he's a hardcore vegan. He's not just, you know, normal vegan. He's very OCD about his veganism, okay? So what the reason I believe Brian was in Portland, well, Portland is the vegan capital of the country. Portland is hands down the most vegan-friendly mid-sized city in the United States with unbelievable food, various all-vegan carts around the city, scattered around the city. Okay? I think Brian was visiting Portland because Portland is the vegan capital of the country. I think Brian was there when he was off of... Uh, work or school when he had some free time, Brian might have even potentially been considering moving to Portland. Maybe he wanted to go check the city out. He had heard it's very vegan friendly. Okay. There's some belief that Brian may have encountered Zana and Maddie at the Greek, the Mad Greek, which also serves a vegan menu. But um, I really um, was looking for this connection to of Brian and Portland and found this and to me, this makes perfect sense that Brian would visit a place like Portland, Oregon. Okay, so that's, that's just one piece here. There's, there's more. So how would that connect to Sandra? Just the fact that he's in Portland, right? Doesn't necessarily connect him to Sandra. Well, I believe Sandra was his first victim. And I think Brian, with his first victim, would have been a little more nervous and um, would have potentially targeted, targeted somebody who was weaker. Now, I don't know for sure. Um, I, you know, there could be another trait that triggers Brian regarding who he targets. Um, there's one other thing here that I did uncover, but um, I, I don't know if there's maybe a, a something that they, maybe they have a certain appearance or maybe they say something, but um, not quite sure there. But I do believe that Sandra could have been targeted because she is um, vulnerable. Keep in mind, Brian likes to fight, but he likes to have the advantage when he fights. He likes to have the upper hand and he likes to ambush. Now, after I made the connection between Brian and Portland, and why would Brian be interested in Portland? And again, it's the most vegan friendly place that you can go. A lot of vegans have a hard time finding places where they have options, right? So it would not surprise me if Brian might have been considering a move to another location. Maybe he was even considering attending school there. But that still didn't really bring me to Sandra, right? So how does that connect us to Sandra? Well, I want to ask everybody if you notice anything in this picture about Sandra. Well, I, I see here that she's wearing this uh, fanny pack and we have the uh, wire coming out. Now, I think that Sandra may have been going through dialysis. And I think Sandra, living in Portland, the most vegan-friendly place in the country, um, could very well have been vegan herself. And at the very least, if she was going through dialysis, I think that she could have potentially been eating at a vegan restaurant, keeping her health in mind. 
What do you all think about that? Still not enough? Still not enough evidence for you? Don't think Sandra could be vegan? Let's look a little bit closer. So, do dialysis patients have to control their diets? Yes, you may be on a special diet. You may not be able to eat everything you like. You may need to limit how much you drink, and your diet may vary according to the type of dialysis. So, it's very feasible that she was keeping her health and her diet in mind while going through what I believe to be dialysis. Still not enough for you? So, let's look a little bit further. Look at what she's holding in her hand. So I had to zoom in here. I was trying to figure out what she might have been drinking. I'm looking for something that supports her being a vegan. Because I think there's a connection here. And sure enough, what did I find? I found uh, she's drinking a Teton Cider Works. Bourbon Barrel Peach Cider. Okay, you can see here in the picture. It's very clear that's what she's drinking. You can see the letters. The bottom of the can there, you can see the branches and the logo. And you can even see the flavor that she's drinking based off the color of the can. Okay. So what is Teton Cider Works? Well, Teton Cider Works is a vegan-friendly drink. They do not use any animal products in any part of their production or bottling process. What do you all think about that? Could Sandra have been vegan? Could Sandra have encountered Brian at a vegan restaurant and then that's how she was chosen as a target? Still not enough evidence for you? How about I show some more? So let's learn a little bit about Sandra. So Sandra was a Washougal resident for many years. She was born in 1949 in Portland, Oregon. She attended the University of Washington. So here we have yet another connection to Brian. Sandra loved to travel. She was very dedicated to her family. She was so excited about them. She loved people and children. And I think that there were also some comments saying that she was very outgoing, a very personable type personality. Could Sandra have gone out to get some food at a vegan restaurant, and maybe Brian zeroed in on her as a target. Maybe Brian followed her from the restaurant back to her house to kind of scope out and see if she would be a good target. And when Brian got to Sandra's house, he realized that it was a good target. You know why? Because it had the perfect layout that appeals to him. It had a private backyard, nobody can see in, surrounded by brush even has a sliding door that you can easily get in and out of. You can see the view there. Nobody could see. So this would be very easy for him to get into this house. And he would be private and protected, just like I mentioned earlier. What does everybody think? Could this be a connection to Sandra? I have more evidence, though, for the skeptics. And I'm not just the only one that uh, thinks that's a private backyard. You can see here in the description, enjoy your privacy on your covered deck looking out to the green space behind you. If you look at Google Maps, it's an open space behind the home. So the Idaho house was very private with a lot of brush and trees in the back protecting his entry and exit. And so does Sandra's house. Still not enough evidence for some of you, I know. So we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about the Travis Juton in the Jamie Lynn Juton case. And um, stick around because this is where it gets even more interesting. So here we have a description of the crime. It was the night of August 13th. The couple was sleeping in their home and they were attacked at 3 a.m. by an intruder with a knife. The intruder was never caught. Okay, just a reminder, up at the top here, 1941st Street would have been Sandra's address. Down here near Salem is Travis and Jamie Lynn's address. Now looking at this crime, um, the husband, Travis, was pronounced dead at his home and his wife. Thankfully, Jamie Lynn survived after being stabbed 19 times. Okay, 
So here, once again, we have a crime of rage and passion. She survived with 19 stab wounds. Okay. The intruder is said to have entered the Juton residence at 3 a.m. and began stabbing the couple as they were in bed. This is exactly what my theory is that happened to Maddie and Kaylee. Still not enough evidence, everyone? Let me show you some more. So here we have Travis's um, uh, obituary. Let's see if we can find out a little bit about Travis. So anyone who played at the same table in games as Travis knew that he was a dominant presence. Very good board game player, but was very humble and would offer to help. Travis loved all living things, so much so that he was completely vegan. I'm telling you, everybody, this is the connection here. Brian was visiting Portland because he was either considering moving there or he was visiting the location just on his free time to check it out because it's the most vegan-friendly place you can go. It's my belief that he encountered Sandra at a vegan restaurant. He may have had a conversation with her, followed her, decided that she was a good target, and he attacked her. Now, I think that he returned to Portland later on the following year because I do think that he found things that appealed to him in Portland and uh, came back. And I think once again, he was visiting a vegan place and encountered uh, Travis and Jamie Lynn. And I think he followed them home. He assessed their residence and he determined that their residence was suitable for the attack. And while they slept in their beds, he snuck in and attacked them while they were sleeping. Here's a view of their residence. And once again, this supports the theory that Brian was very selective and had to be comfortable with the location of the crime. We have another rural location that um, would be somewhere where there would be a limited amount of people who could witness what he was doing. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, everyone. So I mentioned earlier my theory about Kaylee being beaten in the home. I mentioned my belief that Brian was obsessed with fighting and obsessed with beating somebody up badly. Now somehow Jamie Lynn survived this attack and I think Travis saved her life. Now I want to read a little bit more about the details here and share one more thing and let me know what you think about this. While we grieve Travis's loss and we wish for Jamie Lynn's health, we're concerned for the safety of our family, friends, and neighbors. Jamie faces a long road to physical and emotional recovery. Jamie Lynn is recovering from two fractured vertebrae, a fractured shoulder, a fractured skull, and nerve damage. She wasn't just stabbed, everybody. She was beaten. Jamie Lynn suffered 19 stab wounds but she also suffered these additional injuries. Now, some might say that the knife could have caused the fractures, and I, and I do think that that is possible. Um, specifically, the fractured shoulder would be very hard to fracture somebody's shoulder. Um, now, the fractured skull, not quite, sh not quite so sure about that. Um, I, I do think that that could have been more from blows um, from Brian. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do here was try to validate my vegan theory on the vegan restaurant being connected to um, the victims and Brian. Uh, so I decided to um, just kind of start digging in here and I did a little bit of a search um, of where these places are located. And again, it's Silverton, Oregon, where they live. So I decided to just do a, a quick, you know, look up to see what kind of vegan friendly restaurants would be in Silverton, Oregon. And there were a couple that came up, but as I read through them, they didn't make sense. So if you read this one here, it says it serves meat, vegan options available. Now, 
Brian's not okay with that. Brian's not going to eat somewhere that serves meat if he has another option available. Now, he'll go to a restaurant that serves meat and order vegan if there's no other option. And I think that's the case with the Mad Greek. I think there's limited options out there, and that's what brought him to that location. Um, but I think if there were two vegan restaurants side by side, and one of them was uh, meat and vegan, and the other one was straight up vegan, Brian would absolutely go to the straight up vegan restaurant. So when I saw this, I said, no, this I don't think Brian's going to Silverton, Oregon to visit the Finn and Fowl kitchen. So again, what I decided to do is, you know, I kind of scrolled through and I saw once again, you know, serves meat. This one also serves meat. And I said, nope, this one isn't, you know, Silverton as well, serves meat. Nope, here's another Silverton. Nope, serves meat. And it wasn't connecting for me. This wasn't good enough for me. I wanted a, a I needed something more solid, um, you know, to connect the vegan reason. You know, why would, you know, Portland, I can see Portland has, you know, 20 different restaurants down the street that he could go that are all straight vegan. But why was he in Silverton? Why would he have been all the way an hour south in Silverton? Well, and I looked again, vegan restaurants are all serving meat. Well, I just said, well, let me just check what's surrounding So when you do this, you can see kind of what I mentioned. You know, we have those those silver tin places. Um, but look at here. It gives us the option to go just vegan. So we have a difference, right? Vegetarian, veg options. So let's just go straight up vegan, right? That's what Brian would want. And looky there. Salem, Oregon. Did Brian run into the Jutans at the Infinity Room? Is this how he chose them as his target? Did he have a conversation with them? Did they maybe mention they were leaving to go to Hawaii the next morning? Maybe he thought nobody else would be in the home. Maybe he followed them home from the restaurant, just like he did Sandra. Saw that they lived in a rural location. Now, the other question here that I haven't quite answered, and this is where I need everybody's help, is why would he choose these specific people? Now, I do think that there's got to be something in common. There's got to be some trait that they have that bothers him or that triggers him to want to choose these people. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is, but um, still trying to figure that one out. A personality, personality like his, it could be a very minor, small thing that, for whatever reason, stuck with him. Maybe the way somebody looks that picked on him in high school or you know, something like that that he just... For, for whatever reason, sets him off. So we've now arrived at the part of the video where I'm going to reveal the other murder that I think Brian Koberger is connected to. Now, before I do that, I'm going to show you a little bit of how I got onto the trail. So while I was researching Brian, I did re reach out to this person on Instagram who was another account that Brian's account was connected to. And through that research, I noticed that um, there was this clothing company called Havoc. And initially, I thought that that clothing company was located in Grants Pass, Oregon. And I thought I was onto something, right? Okay, he's connected to Oregon. That was back when I was trying to figure out the connection to Oregon. I was looking at these accounts and trying to figure out why he would have been in Oregon. That was before I figured out the vegan connection. So I'd reached out to this person. And the interesting thing here was he... Um, mentioned that the, the company in question here is in Georgia. So when I saw that, it kind of didn't fit what I was looking for, so I moved on, okay? But I didn't forget the fact. Um, this just still resonated with me. So the other thing I did here is I, I went back to this account that I mentioned earlier that was being followed by Brian's account. And I mentioned before how there was just that one post, right, um, by this account. And I noticed that there was a like on this post. And so I decided to look at this like. And it brought me to this account, okay? And once again, I'm like, guy, this is so weird. You know, what are these accounts? What's the, what's the connection to these accounts, okay? And so I bring up this account and I look over here, trying to figure it out. And I see it's a Slim and Huskies, you know? So slimandhuskies.com. And this is where everything kind of just clicked for me because I realized all of these accounts that are connected to Brian are 
shopping accounts. So he's he's doing two things. He's following media online. He's following videos and his interests and his tactical gear and his knives. Those little videos, he's following all of that. But these fake accounts, these extra accounts, or these these other accounts that are showing up, you know, underneath him, in my belief, I think these are because he's traveling around the country and he's going to these locations. And for whatever reason, these locations, he's he's maybe getting a notification or he's following things. And he's got these different accounts. Maybe he's creating an account each time he's going to a new location. But the thing that dawned on me here is there's this kind of theme of all of these accounts being related to clothing, clothing things that he would be interested in, right? There are these like anti-social clothing ski masks being for sale, um, we see a lot of products. We see the outdoor store. That outdoor store is in Virginia. I almost wonder if there could be a crime that he committed in Virginia. Um, this store here is, um, this place here happens to be in Georgia. So I just shared with you a minute ago, I was speaking to somebody who was connected to a clothing company I initially thought was in Oregon. He clarified there in Georgia. So when I came here and I saw this Slim and Huskies, I decided to just see, well, what is this? And it's a restaurant. So just like I mentioned before with going to Portland and the vegan restaurant theme, I think Brian is finding his targets because Brian, remember, Brian has also been quoted as hanging out at a brewery, right? So a brewery is just the type of place that Brian likes to hang out. And that's absolutely what this place is. But I also thought to myself, well, Brian's vegan, right? So it's really important that Brian has a vegan option. And so I just kind of started looking into here again a little bit more. We go to their community. And sure enough, right here, Slim and Huskies has vegan options. So right here I was interested in, and the reason I was interested in Georgia is because this is where this other murder occurred that I believe is connected to Brian. Let's take a look at that murder. So here it is. I believe Brian committed this murder. So Katie Janice was murdered at Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Piedmont Park. Katie Janice, 40 years old, was walking her dog approximately 1 a.m. in the morning. She was attacked in the park and she was stabbed over 50 times. Now check this part out. Janice lived about a mile from Piedmont Park. According to investigators, Janice took her dog Bowie on a walk after having dinner with her partner Emma. So once again, this supports my theory that Brian is picking his targets while he's out interacting in the public. He's at the breweries, he's drinking, he's eating, whatever it is. This is where he's meeting his victims or he's identifying his victims. And from these restaurants, he's following them home and he's deciding if they are suitable to complete his attack. Now, this case is really interesting because it's my understanding that she lived more of an apartment complex, okay? And Brian may have followed her home and an apartment might have not really fit what he was looking for. Now, the interesting thing here is she came out at about 1 a.m. to walk her dog 1 a.m. would be about the time Brian would be lingering outside of a residence waiting for you to go to sleep before he snuck in and attacked. So it's very possible, in my opinion, that he followed her home and was lingering around watching. And she came out to walk her dog very late at night, 1 in the morning, went into the park, and he saw his opportunity. Now I know there's still skeptics out there, so let's look a little, little bit closer and I'll show you another piece of evidence that supports my theory. Now, I mentioned earlier that I believe um, Slim and Huskies could be the connection here. So um, let's take a look at where Slim and Huskies is in relation to Piedmont Park, where this murder happened. Now, keep in mind, we found Slim and Huskies from an account that's directly connected to Brian's account. So Slim and Huskies is a 10 minute trip from Piedmont Park where this murder happened, 2.3 miles away. The victim lived one mile away from the park. 
What do you think, everybody? Could Brian have been in Georgia visiting the brewery Slim and Huskies when he encountered his next victim, followed her? She came out into the park to walk her dog, and he attacked. Still not enough evidence, huh? I have more. Check this out. And this is where I mentioned early on that this video was going to blow your mind. Check it out. So I mentioned. So let's take a look at Katie Janice. Uh, one thing you might notice here is she actually does resemble another one of the victims. Now, if we look at a um, picture of Jamie Lynn and a picture of Katie. Um, slight similarity there. There's another picture of Jamie Lynn that looks a little more like her, but that's not the evidence I'm talking about. What I want to show you here is some of the details about the attack, and you're going to see how these match perfectly what I was just sharing. So, new autopsy, autopsy report reveals that she was stabbed 50 times. Okay, so this lines up with the rage-filled attack. And she actually had the letters F-A-T carved into her chest. Now remember, what do we know about Brian? He used to be overweight when he was in high school. He was bullied. He was picked on. All of a sudden, he got into boxing and fighting. He lost the weight, and he had this aggressive personality. Here we have somebody being stabbed 50 times and has the letters F-A-T carved into their chest. This almost makes me wonder if that might be part of Brian's source of anger, his motivation in picking his targets. Um, he might be harboring some anger from when he was younger and was picked on as an overweight child. This is just a theory. This is just one other connection on top of all of the other ones I've already pointed out to you. But I know you're still skeptical, so I have even more evidence for you. So officers responded to the reports at about 1.10 after Janice's longtime partner, Emma, discovered her body at the park. So she was last seen walking her dog uh, about one o'clock in the morning at the park. Now, there's a statement here that's very similar to the statement that Kaylee's dad made, and I'm going to read that right now. So this is a statement from um, uh, her partner's dad. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find his name here. So Janice was our victim. Uh, Emma Clark is her partner, and this is Emma Clark's dad making this statement. And he says that... Um, According to the medical examiner's report, she was stabbed 50 times. She was stabbed in the throat and at least 15 times in the face, including her eyebrows, her eyelids, her nose, and her lips. Now, this is very key. Keep that in mind. She was stabbed in the throat, face, eyebrows, eyelids, nose, and lips. She was stabbed in each breast and in the back, which damaged her aorta and her left lung. Now, you might recall that Maddie's left lung, I believe, I'm not sure if it was the left, but Maddie's lung was also damaged very badly in that attack, which, in my opinion, Brian had targeted locations that he would strike, knowing the vital organs and, and where he would stab. Remember, he watched all those videos, all of that training. He knew how to attack somebody. Now, this is the part that really caught my attention here. So again, here's his statement. Joe Clark is saying, this is undoubtedly a very angry, disturbed person. The only thing I can think of to do so much damage to someone. He said, adding that he believes more than one person killed Janice. Now you'll recall, we thought the same thing with the Idaho murders. These murders were so violent, so rage filled that we thought at one point, it was more than one person. And here we have the absolute same statement being made by somebody else on this case. I don't see how one person could have inflicted that much damage on someone. Well, I'll tell you what. One person who's obsessed with violence, obsessed with learning ways to hurt people, harboring all of this anger that he just releases on his victims when he does these attacks... This matches per perfectly across all of these four murders. Um, I'm telling you, these are connected. And I know you need more, more uh, proof, right? So I'm going to show you more. Yeah. 
And now this is the key piece here that I think connects this crime even more to the others. So the medical examiner's report released in November revealed that Janice was stabbed more than 50 times in the face, neck, and torso. She also suffered blunt force injuries to her face, neck, and extremities. It's exactly what I was saying. I believe he attacked and beat Kaylee. I believe he has this process that he does in these crimes and these attacks where he enjoys beating his victims. And here is just another connection of him doing that. This is three out of the four. Remember, I, I suspect it was Kaylee beaten. We had Jamie Lynn severely beaten where she had a fractured skull. And here we have a third victim who's severely beaten with suffered blunt force injuries to her face, neck, and extremities, her throat being slashed, and the letters F, A, and T etched into her body. This is an extremely angry person who it has a very specific motive for doing this. But I know that's still not enough, so I do have another piece of evidence to share. So just right here we see Janice was stabbed more than 50 times in the face, neck, and torso. I do think that's significant, and I'm going to show you why. So we're going to circle back to the Jutin attacks. And remember, Jamie Lynn survived the attacks. And I just went over a couple of other crimes with you where the victim was stabbed in the face. We don't exactly know the exact injuries that the Idaho victims suffered. But when I went back to this case and I was comparing all of these together, after reading the last case and how the victim had been stabbed in the face and neck, and then I came back and I watched this video of Jamie Lynn. I want, I want to see if you notice anything here. Hey everybody, do you see what I'm talking about here? This wasn't released anywhere in the media. This wasn't in any news reports. Um, we have that information on another case. The fact that that victim was stabbed in the face, in the neck area. And here we have a surviving victim that I believe is linked, who has a wound on her face, just like the other victims. Let me know what you all think about all of this. I know this is a lot of information, but that's kind of how sometimes these things come together. Um, I really believe these crimes are connected. So just a quick recap. We know Brian's uh, MO. I believe that the connection here is Brian was visiting Portland due to its vegan locations. I think he interacted with these people who are involved in this vegan lifestyle. He chose them as targets and um, proceeded with his crimes. I think Brian has traveled to multiple states and has committed these crimes. This is literally the first one that I uncovered. I haven't even looked into other states yet, but I'm feeling pretty confident that all four of these murders were done by the same person, and I do think that person is Brian Koberger. Let me know what you think, please, about this evidence. Um, I really appreciate you watching, especially if you got through that whole video. Please subscribe. I'm going to have a lot more content coming out. We're really trying to build a um, nice community with this channel where we can share our ideas, talk about our theories, um, You know, just a, a nice welcoming group. Um, we're off to a great start, and thanks again for watching. Until next time.